Hello and welcome to the Business of Authority. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And today we're going to talk about when to DIY. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me tee this up because this is not the episode we thought we were going to record. But um, so, Jonathan, we know that you took last week off to work on your bathroom renovation. Yeah. Right. And so I was teasing him. Uh, I guess last night via Slack and said, where are the pictures? I haven't seen the pictures. And so finally this morning, he sends me like 90 photos and I'm really excited to go through them because, you know, I love demos. This is, I love this kind of stuff. And so I'm thinking I'm going to see like the demo and then I'm going to see like the new bathroom and I get to the end of the, of the pictures and we're still at the demo, like the demo's done, (laughs) (laughs) but there's no new bathroom yet. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so so what we started to do is we started to talk about all right. So um, why would you demo this to yourself? And so Jonathan, I mean that was pretty much my first question is like so there are probably a gazillion people in your area that you could hire to do this who have a lot more experience than you do in in doing a bathroom. What made you decide to do it yourself? Mm. Yeah, and this does tie into business decisions for you know when when to do things on your own, when to hire them on, and so forth. So we stick promise. with us. Yes, I promise. So it would be easy to say it'll be a half or less the price for me to do it, but that's not really that's not really a big piece of the decision. the The biggest piece of the decision to do it was that we've been in this house. We, we first toured this house, I think, in the summer of two thousand six when we were looking. And that day, we were like, this place is perfect, but we have to immediately redo this bathroom. That was 17 years ago, and not one single thing has changed in that bathroom in 17 years. Because every time we talk about it, it spirals. We just go around in this circle. And I, I, I do this in my head, and I've talked to other people who do it in their head too, where there's this thing called yak shaving, which people who know know, but it's kind of like, it's kind of like, well, if we're going to redo the vanity, then we need to redo the tile behind it. And the tile goes all the way around the bathroom. So we have to do the entire tile. And if we're going to take all the tile out, then we have to take the tub out. But it's a cast iron tub, which means you have to smash it out. And there'll be some structural things underneath it, probably. And we'll have to redo the plumbing. We have to redo the plumbing. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you're like, yep. you know, it's a full, you can't just fix one thing because it's like, well, if we're going to do that, we might as well. So the scope creep is like incredible. And, and then you do nothing. You come back around to, well, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And it's not fine. I mean, it was awful. The bathroom's awful. It was leaky. It was non-functional, um, really needed to be redone a long time ago. So the number one reason why we're doing it ourselves was because we, we needed to break the paralysis. And that was a way to dramatically decrease the complexity of getting started by just taking a sledgehammer to the vanity and being like, well, we're in it now. <laughs> so, so, so wait, t- before you go too far with that, so, so you, you got some proposals or some bids? Yeah. Over the years, we've had people in for other things and like, well, you know, if we were going to do the, if we were going to do this bathroom, what would that look like? And the, the level of uncertainty and the, the number of decisions, it just, it geometrically expands as soon as you have other people involved so you know first of all the pr- the prices are like 50 65 75 thousand dollars for for like a little bathroom and and okay it seems if, like a lot if that's the price that's the price but there, there's also like you know and we you know we don't know if this is a load-bearing wall we don't know how the plumbing's run mm-hmm. the house is from the 30s so it's almost 100 years old we could find anything in there we might have to open up the kitchen ceiling to get at the plumbing Cast iron snow. How are we going to? Have fit you it never up the watched stairs? Property Brothers? Of course, there's something lurking behind. Yeah, there's life. always something lurking, <laughs> yeah. especially yeah. in an old house. Yeah. And the bathroom had been sort of refinished a couple times, so you know there were like two layers of tile on the floor. That, but you know, all of these, there's just like so many unknown unknowns, and and the people that we that that we did talk to about it rightly so we're just setting expectations about all the surprises that they have found on projects like this in the past and it just it just fed the paralysis it was like we do not want the kitchen ceiling ripped out you know it's just like so much so so many just the complexity of the job was 
it added to the sort of nerve wracking inability to pull the trigger. Plus, the I don't know about other places, but around here, it's extremely difficult to get anybody to show up to even like, you know, to get someone to to return a phone call even. And so you you don't feel like you're getting the cream of the crop. You don't feel like you're getting it feels like anybody that it does show up is probably not that great, not that busy. Right, uh, not busy enough. Right. And so anybody good, it was going to be a big waiting list. And uh, it's just like. And then once, and once you make that decision and you, you pick the horse, you're riding that horse to the end. So, if, and, you know, right. my, my. But you'd have, rather ride your own horse than somebody else. Yeah. Else. There's just so much uncertainty, so much uncertainty. And, you know, I, I have family members who have sued people that, that, you know, just left a job half done and disappeared with the deposit. And there's horror, horror stories abound. And even people I know who are tradespeople that I know well are like, oh, we're booked out three months, man. We can't, you know, you know. And so then it just gets pushed off and pushed off. And 17 years later, you still have this leaky tub. So it was weird. I don't know what was in the air, but but one day, Erica and I almost just like looked at each other and like, we should just demo the bathroom ourselves. We should just do it. And because she's great at, at design and finishes and all mm -hmm. of that stuff. She can tile. She's tiled a bunch of stuff. I've done all of the construction and demo work in the past. So, I mean, we have the skills to do it. Yes, an expert would be way faster and way better. And, you know, instead of me up, watch, you know, teaching myself how to cap off plumbing on YouTube for an hour the night before and then doing it the next day, instead of that, it would be someone who just does it every day and they'd come in and boom, boom, boom. It would take them 15 minutes. It took me like three hours. This is what's so fascinating, though, because I just know anybody listening to this in our usual audience is going to go, yeah, I've had clients like that where... I could come in and I could do this thing that I do way faster than they could with mm -hmm. a higher degree of confidence that it's going to be right, but they chose to do it themselves. Why right. did they do that? Right. That's what's so, and, and, and the other piece I'm hearing is that like, there was uncertainty either way, like, because you, you didn't necessarily know, just because you did it yourself doesn't mean that you know what's behind the walls, right? You right. could still We still might have had to problems. open up the kitchen ceiling. Right. Right, which you didn't, mm. I, judging from your, your emails no. during this period. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, so it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the uncertainty. It's the making the bet. And I've heard, um, I've talked to sort of like, this is a long story, but, but people who have hired me in the past talking about the process of hiring like developers to work on a project and, and the fear of, of, like, is this, am I going to be happy with this experience? And there's no mm -hmm. way for a non-expert to judge the capabilities of the expert. You right. know, it's, it's like, so this is, it's really, the exercise is very, has been very interesting for me because for the level of trust that you need to have the, in, in a scenario like this, where you, you just got like um, a non-expert, uh, enough skill to be dangerous like uh, all software mm -hmm. developers have had that client was like oh i know enough to be dangerous like they literally say that and a lot of times they're the worst kind of client because then they're asking you a million questions about how you're doing it and they've got opinions about how it should be done is okay. sort of uninformed opinions which would have right. been me on this project mm -hmm. the bathroom project and <laughs> i knew been that poking your nose in yeah yeah exactly which is I, hard not to do because they're in your house right even just out of pure curiosity, like, oh, why are you doing it like that? Like, I want to know why it's like mm -hmm. that. I want to, you know, it would be so annoying. It would have been so annoying. It would have been frustrating for me and for them. Uh, so the so to to flip it around, like to use your your the point that you just made about, you know, like why did this client, why does this client insist on messing with things when when I can just do it so much faster and easier? It's because they can't believe it. It's like they trust. Well, it's, it's trust, trust, really. Exactly. Yeah. It's pure trust or, yeah. or um, ability. So I, I put some of that on myself as well. You know, it's not just that it's just impossible. It's next to impossible to air quotes know that the experience of the project is going to be pleasurable. Like if, if somebody said um, it's $50,000 and I'm going to snap my fingers and it's going to be done and it's going to look like this that you wanted, mm -hmm. that's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. 
but that's not a project. Projects are like these relatively long, drawn out, collaborative, extended series of decisions, lots of, um, lots of project communication. And I just wasn't up for it. You know, I was like, this will take three or four times longer if I do it myself. And there were probably some things that could have been done better at the end, but the, the, complexity of the decisions is way way lower like geometrically lower and to me that was like that was the thing that 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 was the only thing that was going to get us off the fence really so so there's trust so you in this case you didn't have an option that you trusted um i'm gonna that argue we could get w- yeah yeah, yeah. And I'm going to, because there might've been one, but if they're not available, then it's not available. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm going to argue that there is a control issue here because that's, I'm hearing that like you wanted to be in control of the process and the experience. Not, well, the, ex- I want the experience to be the way I want it to be, which I want it to be a pleasurable experience. Like every, yeah, every client's going to want that. The contr- yeah. uh, well, if we hired someone and, and they demonstrated in the early days of the project that they were just a plus. I'd leave them alone, but it would be too late at that point. But that's what I mean, though. It's not about like micromanaging. It's about on the front end, you have a lot more control doing it this True. way than you would the other way. You're at the mercy of the person you've hired exactly. at that point. Oh, I have another job. Sorry, I'll see you in two exactly. weeks. Or worse, they don't tell you that. They just don't show up. Right. And you're calling them. They don't call you back. I mean, everybody's had contractors like that. Right. But then the other thing is the what I would call your perceived experience. Like you consciously chose this because it was a better perceived experience for you than the level of unknown with hiring somebody to do it. Mm -hmm. So let me contrast this with something that happened in roughly the same time frame for me. So I have a, uh, a a Martin acoustic guitar, which is a beautiful, expensive uh, gift that I got in the early nineties. And it's made out of wood, just like the bathroom. <laughs> and and it, uh, due to humidity and heat and fluctuation of the wood, the binding started to snap off and become detached and the bridge was pulling away from the body. So it, it needed mm-hmm. some repair work. There's no universe in which I could do that. Mm-hmm. So okay, I have... acting. There's just no... Like, I don't know enough to be dangerous. I, I would surely ruin the piece. There's no... There's no way. So I found someone who was a recommendation from a vintage guitar store in my neighborhood that recommends this one particular guy. And I, I left a $4,000 guitar with this guy I just met. See ya. Mm-hmm. Like I drove to his house and put it in his garage. <laughs> and but, see, so the, but see the difference though. See the yeah, difference. That's my point. Because right. you're handing it off versus inviting them in to mess up your life. Right. It's not a project for me. So first of all, no capability to do it. Second of all, it's not an invasion of, it's not going to be in my face. And it took him like three months, Mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, and it was expensive, right? But it's just completely different decision. So that I I think that's pretty interesting. So now if you, just for a second, if we flip this to like us as people selling authority type services, the the sort of black box nature and the the super clear desired outcome because the desired outcome was like i want this guitar back as close to new as possible there's no question about like is this exactly where you want the sconce is this how you want the tile oriented there's not a million decisions to make it's just repair this get it back to the way it was and Mm -hmm. it was a very very clear success criteria and it was it required literally zero of my involvement other than dropping it off and paying for it well you would rely on his assessment of as close to new as possible right that it sounds right. and, correct and, and it works correctly right. and when i dropped it off you know um in this in this huge garage outfitted with every you know outfitted for nothing but luthier guitar repair type stuff and the dude was like obviously a master craftsman. I mean, like the stuff mm-hmm. hanging on the wall was just insane. Yeah. So instant, like as soon as I walked in, it was just some residential, you know, little area, but you walk in the garage and you're like, okay, this guy is a master. And, and he talked, but he still taught a great bedside manner, talked to me for like 15 minutes about, about any of my concerns, where the thing was, had been stored, what I could do in the future once it was fixed, all this other stuff, very much put me at ease. 
But then I could just leave it, leave, forget about it, and just know that at some point, he didn't even tell me how long it would take, but at some point it would be done. And it's that is like a service like that is such an easier impulse buy. It feels that feels like a productized service to me or um, there, or like a product, you know, like or yeah, a course I, or a workshop. I'd push it closer to a product just because you're not interacting. I mean, just at the beginning. Yeah. But then they do their thing and then they hand it back to you. But right. I think a lot of a lot of our, our listeners are people who have a thing that is involved. And mm-hmm. it's not that you can just go away and do it and bring it back and polish it up for the client. It's they have to be involved in it. So the experience yeah. is really critical. And then, you know, I mentioned trust, control, the perceived experience. I think the other thing is the time trade off, mm-hmm. right? So you traded off time, maybe for this, for this in the bathroom. And I say maybe because if the person had disappeared, it would probably take just as much time elapsed time it would take more yeah, of your time. time right yes but so there's there's that so it's when you start to think about how your client makes these decisions uh, the first thing that struck me was oh yeah i mean i can see why somebody might say you know what i'm just going to do this myself this is too hard it's too you're asking too much of me and i don't trust you enough to know that you can get me there sure you got all these other people there but i don't know about me right i don't feel like I can get there. Right. Even if, even if it's like, I might be a bit, like I said before, like I would probably be not the greatest client because I don't want to, I'm not just going to go to the house and the Cape and come back and it'll be done. Mm-hmm. So that, that would have been a, we had our floors done like that. Like that would have been a, an interesting approach to be like, we're going to be out of town for a week or two weeks or however long. And then that would put a real deadline window on them. And, and then we just come back and it would be done. The, the, impossibility of that would be that we would need to be apprised of surprises we would need to make decisions about finishes you know there's just no way that it wouldn't be collaborative there would have had to been so much pre-work you know like waterfall software development there would have had so much like this is going to be the design this is going to be it's not like it's not like one of those design shows where you know uh some kid gets their elderly parent out of the house for a weekend and you know like a design team comes in and redoes the bathroom and they're just like hope they like it you know (laughs) we were going to be really picky about it well i mean and there are ways around it like you could hire a designer like in the thing with the vacation you hire a designer who makes sure because a designer in conjunction with a builder it's like they're covering all aspects of the brain Mm-hmm. And you can have the right designer is going to push all those questions to you in advance. You're going to choose everything. You you will have ordered it so that all it all arrives. And by the way, let me just comment. I know Erica was involved in that, and I was chuckling because she had everything arrived. She opened the boxes, checked everything. Yeah. So like you kind of had a designer in this case. But right. most people, if you do the going away thing, you probably need another team member. So if you're doing like brand strategy, and you have a designer you know, a graphic designer help you, you bring other people into the process, or maybe you have a copywriter that you use. And when sometimes when you do those things, it allows you to make a different promise to your client and make it easier for them to hire you. Mm. But it's, this is the stuff that goes through people's heads when mm. they decide. So let me, let me t- pile on another business thing here, because I did a consultation recently with a person who does brand related stuff. and was trying and had a had kind of like a, a two option for two option offering it was like you know good better best style thing but was having a lot of trouble with the the middle option and the 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 first option was basically like a half day workshop where where like I'll teach you everything I know I'll give you all my tools and then you just go do it you know and then the mm-hmm. the top option was like completely done for you minimal involvement by the client uh, maximum involvement by the consultant and, and very, very high ticket. But then the middle one was kind of a watered down version of the top one. And, and she kept on saying when we were talking about it, it was just like, you know, instead of like it being a hundred percent thorough, it was like 50% thorough. And instead of it being like 20 frameworks or 40 frameworks, it was only five of the, you know, the 80, 20 rule kind of thing. And as and and she, yeah, why would I buy that? Yeah, that's yeah. one thing. But I was, at the same time, 
from the client perspective, since I was totally, you know, I was the fresh eyes from the, from my perspective, I didn't really see the difference between this level two and level three, because it was a whole bunch of deliverables and inputs that were meaningless to me. So I was like, well, if I'm going to get the desired outcome with, with both, if I'm going to get a pretty good outcome with the middle one, why would I spend three times more for the one that's a little bit better? Maybe, I don't know. So that's faster. Right. And so I was like, oh, you know what it is? It's, it's like, instead of making and the other funny thing was, she was like, it would actually be harder for me to do this because because it's not the way she likes to work. It's not um, it was it was it would actually make her job harder yeah. to do the middle one, the cheaper one. And I was like, all right. So so in the sort of classic three tier format, the bottom, you've got DIY training and tools and then you're off to the races the top option you've got completely concierge white glove done for you turnkey and in the middle you do, uh, done with you and, and she, her middle one wasn't done with you it was just a small done for you and i was like oh right so in order for the buyer to perceive how much better the done for you the third top option was the second one should take them way longer and require way more input from them so a real like like my bathroom feels or would feel like so it was in in that that was counterintuitive to her first because it seemed like the the time involved her time involved should increase at each level so the middle one should be less time than than mm -hmm. than the third one I, am i am explaining this well yeah yeah because the thing is though it strikes me is do you need a second option yeah she definitely did okay because where i go with that is if I don't want to work the way that the second option, you know, has to be in quotes, then I'm not going to offer it. Um, I, right. I would want to switch it around and find something that has a value and an outcome that's worth the price and in a way that I can be excited about delivering it. And that's what we did. So, so instead of it being a miniature version of three, we turned it into a combination of one and three. So it was truly the middle that, that she would be happy to deliver so yeah, it was like that's the key right so it's training like option one but then sort of like office hours and guidance but not implementation and so the 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 client with her oversight would still be doing all the work but she would stay involved while they did it and she would you know offer guidance when they were getting stuck or when they were getting hung up or whatever mm -hmm. and and she was like oh yeah i could do that all day long and it would increase the the likelihood of success would be higher than with option one, but the the downside of it, which was critical that we got this downside in there, was that it was going to take like I can't remember exactly, but if if option I think it was going to take like four months instead of option three, which only takes like six weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah, you so it's kind speed. of right because it's kind of dry, where before it was like four weeks and then option three was six weeks it's like well that sounds better four weeks sounds better and cheaper so <laughs> anyway i just wanted to that occurred to me was since we were talking about you were talking about branding and also the experience of the project and the time the calendar time from when you start to when you finish because that increases the client's opportunity cost which well, they don't like and there's also situations where and this may be more common when you have uh, non-corporate B2B clients where you have a client, you, you've talked to them, you've kind of laid out the process, and they, they're still kind of doing it themselves. They haven't said no yet, but they're going through this process that it's kind of like they're selling themselves on hiring somebody because when they're doing it themselves, it's not working. And that could be marketing, it could be selling, it could be like development for somebody who's like one of your clients who goes, oh, yeah, I know just enough to be dangerous. I'm <laughs> going to give that a shot. I'm going to do my own website. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and I think that's what happens sometimes as well, which is why when somebody says no, a lot of times what they're really saying is not yet. Not yet, right. Because if I, if I sawzall through my live plumbing, I'm going to be like, eh, forget it. I'm not uh -huh. qualified for this. Uh, I'm going to pull the ripcord and just, and, and I learned my lesson. And, uh, you know, like if there's some catastrophe, I could learn my lesson and then be like, oh, 50,000 doesn't sound that bad. Or putting up with right. <laughs> some workmen in the house for a week doesn't sound that bad. Yeah. I mean, you know, before the show, I was telling you that my, my, um, 
my one story of, of besides painting of do it yourself, which involved going to um, Lowe's and buying a mini sledgehammer because I couldn't <laughs> swing the big one. Like I literally couldn't, I could lift it up, but I couldn't swing it. And so I just all my only project was to demo a closet that had a bunch of these old shelves on it. Like, I can do this. So I was like so excited about having a sledgehammer. Like I've never <laughs> had one, even though it was kind of small. It wasn't very manly looking for sure. But anyway, so I I swung it and I hit the thing and it just bounced off. Nothing happened. I'm like, man. So I swing it again and boom, nothing happens. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm tired. I'm not used to like <laughs> swinging a 30 pound thing in the air and have it do nothing. I'm like, I could be at this all day. And I, I put it down in this case, I will admit, I called my husband and he, he agreed to do it because it was such a small, such a small project. But if it, if he hadn't been there, I would have called my handy guy and said, Hey, just do this. I don't care. Charge mm -hmm. me what you need to do, but do this. I just didn't want to spend my time doing it. It sounded like fun. I had the goggles, I had the sledge, but it wasn't, <laughs> it was right. not how I wanted to spend my time. It was like a romantic idea of how I wanted to spend some time. That's and a, so it, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point is that, is that um, the bathroom project sounded like fun to me. Yeah. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like why would that sound like fun? But uh, it did. It gives, there's something, there's this empowerment. Because like we're not planning on never moving from this house. Like this is it. And, and the level of, um, yeah, empowerment's the right word. It's just like to there's a bit of catharsis because we've been been wrestling with the deficiencies of this bathroom for a long time we've been living with them and it's not it's not just visual like there are problems like structural and mechanical problems in the bathroom that have been super you know like a pebble in your shoe but for 15 mm -hmm. years or whatever i said and so it's sort of cathartic to kind of smash the whole thing down and be like i cannot believe you know and like get into the shower wall and the reality is you don't need to open up the kitchen ceiling. And it was really not that big a deal. And we wouldn't have had to retile the whole bathroom. And like all of the the, the decision-making processes that kept us paralyzed turned out in retrospect to have been unfounded. And knowing the the sort of having a, a more than enough to be dangerous knowledge of the systems in this place where I will probably live for the rest of my life uh, or close to it, is super empowering. It's like, oh, well, if something happens, I know exactly where to do mm -hmm. the thing and what needs to be done and how to do it and where to get the stuff and what stuff to get. Control. So it's kind of an investment. Yeah, am I coming across like a control freak? No, and I'm not saying it in that way though. It's This is a value because there's nothing wrong with this being exciting to you. Like, why is that bad? Like we all like what we like, and you know, I just refuse to judge people for that, yeah. right? So, but it's it's that control, and then the other piece, if you think about this, is that afterwards, when it's all done, the two of you have a bonding story, much well, of the whole family. But you can say, "Oh, remember yeah. when we did that and this remember, happened?" Totally, totally. Yeah, and look at that tile. You see how the, like that one little that corner <laughs> is out of place. Remember how that, that happened because uh -huh. the dog came in and. And yeah. rush me, and I did this thing. So yeah, there, it's a bonding experience. And the, yeah. I think what's really important here is what you're showing by talking about this is you're showing what was in your mind at the time you made the purchase decision, what led right. up to it, what what the purchase decision was, or in this case wasn't, and then what happens after. Mm. And the second that we understand that this is what our buyers are going through. We can figure out how to appeal to them. Now, in yep. this case, it would have been really hard for somebody to uh, to be hired by you. You probably were just not their ideal client. Yeah, it would have been it, a bad. I would have been a bad client. But e even that, though, I'm I'm saying I'm not sure you would have that you could have been convinced to buy. It was a very narrow set of circumstances, and because what you were looking for is local. Right. You can't right, go, yeah. oh, there's the perfect guy, but he's in Seattle. Right. And that's not going to help here. Right. So, yeah, because if, if you've got a national or international practice, you could find perhaps enough Jonathans to mm -hmm. make a business, but not in this case. Right. Right. Yeah. The supply is just like massively constricted, you know, mm -hmm. so there's no I mean, every every time 
so you know we're, we live in a neighborhood a lot of people have dogs so a lot of people are walking dogs and i'm you know all day long i'm like bringing debris out to the the driveway <laughs> and uh so people get to talk in and i would say if i talk to five people four of them gave me a recommendation for oh i've got a guy i've got a guy <laughs> all different all different people it's like i'll call him you know it's it's almost like this black market of plumbers or whatever mm-hmm. where everybody's got a guy that they trust and and i do that does actually work on me because it's well it's a different story but 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 now that <laughs> I'm like i'm like this is my defense against ai because now i know how to do plumbing <laughs> 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 and that's never going to go out of style. Well, it's good. Yeah, you can you can always make money doing plumbing. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. But of course, the the it's interesting to it's just sort of a, a tangent. But the when the supply is so constrained, the level the wor- word of mouth is like through the roof. Like people mm-hmm. are having Rolodex moments, walking their dogs by me. Like they're walking their dog past me. You're like, hey, do you need a plumber? <laughs> I see you. <laughs> I see you've got a bunch of copper pipe in your hand. And, uh, you know, and they know I'm the homeowner because we're all neighbors and, and, but the, the Rolodex moments are just off the charts when there's a, a, an, um, a re- an obvious need or an obvious, uh, possibly obvious need. And, and this understanding, this sort of shared understanding that it's impossible to get these, get people to come to the house and do anything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You yeah. Like a back channel. It's, I mean, it is so interesting. And I think that the reason I wanted us to talk about this today is just because it's so easy to see because most of us have had to hire somebody for our homes to do something that either worked out wonderfully or the opposite. Mm -hmm. And it's so fascinating to see what goes through people's minds. And if you just want a microcosm of this, whatever city you're in, go to the next door app for your city and your neighborhood. And God, I hope it's not just mine, but you'll get these people going, oh, so-and-so was great. And then somebody else will go, oh, I want somebody who's cheap and fast and great. You know, you, you know the rule, right? <laughs> you can only get two of those. But um, yeah, so people's expectations are all over the lot. And if in the way we define our ideal client, the way we understand what they're looking for, and then the way we craft our options for them, if, when those all mesh, it's amazing. But in this situation, there probably was no one as a general contractor who you would have hired. Like they would have wasted their time calling on you and doing a proposal. And that's yeah. part of the advantage, though, is like understanding where they're coming from and recognizing the signs mm-hmm. that they are not a fit. You actually just brought up something that hadn't consciously occurred to me until just now which is that I don't like being on such a, like have zero negotiation power, zero. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's not really about the money, but, but control you, you presented <laughs> not, it's, yeah. I don't see it like that. It's, it's more nuanced than that. I think that it's like, it's like everything. It's, it's almost like every conversation would be like an ultimatum, you know, because the, because the supply and demand are so mismatched where we live. So give me an example like somebody there's no there's no like competition between the sellers so you can say whatever they want mm-hmm. you know uh, give you you know you've you've certainly surely i don't know if you've ever had this experience personally but i'm sure you've had worked with people who've talked about giving somebody the jesus price so like i don't like think they i've don't, heard the jesus price no. yeah this is a it's a chris moyer quote my uh my last boss but uh you know, you don't really want the job because you're busy or maybe you're seeing some red flags. So you give them a price that's so high. They go, Jesus. Oh, OK. <laughs> and they just like don't want the job. But if you're going to pay me that much, I'll squeeze it into the schedule. And there's mm-hmm. just no I mean, I don't I guess I just don't like the 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 imbalance, though. I mean, so what you're saying, I think, is so if you were getting these fifty thousand dollar quotes, there's a part of you that thinks it's a thirty thousand dollar job, but they're saying fifty because right. they have all the control. So you're paying more than you need to. Well, I'm paying what I need to to get them to do it, which is mm-hmm. so. Here, here's the other funny thing: like, like if somebody said, so these are more buying decisions, right? So this is kind of this is this whole episode is kind of turning into a jobs to be done interview where 
somebody made a purchase decision one way or the other and and then you kind of interview them about what was exactly going through their minds and it's always so fascinating how complicated it is mm-hmm. it's so much more complicated than like here are the benefits here's the price take it or leave it and uh one of the things that happened i noticed is that when i go to like home depot or lowe's or something i don't even look at the prices it's all way cheaper than having somebody do it right so it's like that's what they did for you right they right they, they adjusted they anchored your, high right they know. set a high anchor i almost bought a 300 hundred dollar nail gun yesterday for a single use <laughs> <laughs> because there's not not a ton of room to use a regular hammer mm-hmm. i'm like no nah, i'll just end up this will just end up taking up space in the garage like that was the main reason i didn't buy it you know because yeah, you could justify it if you wanted it for something else you're like oh might as well buy it for this yeah if i was going to use it twice itself. it would have made sense mm-hmm. but yeah so you just go in and it's like you know sheer it's like a joke the, the prices are a joke compared to like the what the budget would have had to be and then who knows if it creeped and all of the other oh there's a surprise and we got to do it like this and um whoops we damaged the vanity when we were installing it's like i want to damage the vanity when installing it i don't want somebody else to damage it yeah oh see now you hit my buttons because that's the thing that drives me crazy about contractors when they're not careful mm-hmm. and they just like bump into things they scratch things like i the guys who did my floor made like three mistakes because they were oafs and <laughs> you know it's like yeah but I still, I, you know, it's not a do-it-yourself job for me. It's not an option. So I'm going to have to hire somebody. Yeah, like the guitar. You know, it's mm-hmm. just not an option. Just wasn't an option. Not feasible. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I just realized. So I've just gone through the same process in my business. So I'm starting up a new podcast. And so I, I wanted help. I mean, you know me. I'm not a DIYer generally. And so I, I, I was, and I asked you about this too, because I was fascinated with AI and can AI help me with this podcast? And so I looked at some people that I'd seen, I did some searches and I found like three or four people, any of which would probably be fine that were, but they were all super expensive. And when I say super expensive, like $3,000 a month, which I thought was really expensive Mm. and, and they'll do everything for you including be, like being there and recording it for you. I'm like, I think I could handle that myself. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, so I was looking at all this and then I was looking at the bottom end and the bottom end was, oh, I can record here. I can edit it in this. And, you know, thinking of me doing audio editing is pretty funny. Mm-hmm. But I was like, I think AI could make this really simple. And you press this button here, you press this button here. So I logged into a couple of these things and then I tried it. I did a sample tape and I went, oh my God, I don't want to do this. I don't care if it's easy or hard. I hate this. Get me (laughs) out of here. Get me out of here. And so what I wound up doing instead is looking at something that was under $1,000, but not, you know, $50 a month from these other services together where they would create an experience that I wanted. I would have a dedicated audio person who would do the stuff. Um, It's more than one person. So if something happens, there's a backup. But I went through this whole process of thinking through it. And I I can't imagine that everybody who does a podcast goes or thinks about doing it goes and looks and says, oh, I will edit it myself here. Let's see what that looks like. Like I was really kind of crazy about it. And I think it was probably, um, you know, fear about like just doing it. But, so I need to look at every little piece. But the the firm that I've chosen was with me through that whole process and never tried to sell me um, like hard on their solution. It was just, well, this is how it works. Here's the advantages. Here's the disadvantages. And so I, you know, I came to that solution, but I, I was never a good candidate for the do everything for me. Mm-hmm. And realistically, I was never a good candidate for the bottom end. You know, mm-hmm. give me the, the best DIY, tool yeah. and I'll do it myself. Right. Yeah. That's a, yeah. I, I just, it's funny. Like, like somebody has been, e- someone very helpfully has been emailing me with, you know, they, they're making, this person w- would just like make 20 shorts from from like one of my podcasts, this show, Ditching Hourly, and, you know, did a good job. He'd send them over and he'd say, uh, you know, you can share these on 
YouTube if you want. I just wanted to show you like what kind of work I do and, you know, and they're pretty good. They're good. It's like they look like other stuff that you'd see on YouTube or whatever. And obviously the guy is like trying to get me as a client, mm -hmm. um, but he, he never made the ask. Right. And I wasn't going to I wasn't going to open the conversation. Right. So he sent it to me. I'm like, great. Thanks. These look great. And he did it again, like a month later and again, <laughs> a couple of months later. And I'm like, is this guy ever going to pitch me? <laughs> and so finally he said, you know, oh, you know, it's, I, I did all of these things for you all, you know, uh, over the course of time. And, uh, you know, of course, I, I would like to get you as a client still never get, sends me to a, a pricing page or anything. And so I had to ask him, like, well, what are your rates? And uh, and he came back with like, you know, two thousand bucks a month. And and I'm like, I just don't I can't make a business case for it. Like if I'm going to spend two thousand bucks a month, like it might be it might be that this person, it, I think he's doing them manually. He's probably using some AI tools, but they're better than AI. So he's he's probably doing a lot of work. And he's got to listen to the whole episode. So minimum, mm -hmm. he's got to put in an hour for everyone. It's probably taken three, four hours to do them. So, so it's probably not like the greatest hourly rate, you know, but I mm -hmm. just can't make the business. If I'm going to spend 2000 because I'm not, I'm not thinking, this is similar to your podcast story. I'm not thinking um, whether or not it's worth $2,000 for this person to spend their time doing it. Right. It's probably a, a price that is relatively low profit for this person. So I'm not going to use the word fair or not fair, but he probably couldn't price it much lower and feel like it was worth doing. But if I'm going to spend $2,000 a month on my business, not on that, but on my right. business, it's not going to be YouTube yeah. shorts. Yeah, that's the thing. And that's what every single client, what goes through their head right. when they decide to buy you, like, what else could I use that money for? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I felt the same way. Yeah, $3,000 a month. I mean, I could argue it's worth it. I mean, if, if I get one client through that, that would certainly pay for itself. But, you know, it's like it's <laughs> but, a lot of, <laughs> I know, <laughs> I just, I can't bring myself to, to, to write that, not that I write checks, but I can't bring myself to, to spend that. So he, yes, and agreed. And he, now here's that, that, that you made. So this, this, in my case with this, uh, shorts editor, or whatever you'd call it. Uh, his promise was deliverables. It wasn't results. Right. If if he was promising results, I'd spend it all day long. Mm -hmm. If he was pro if he promised, yeah, I'd get an additional, uh, I don't know, a hundred thousand views a month and an additional thousand subscribers a month for two thousand dollars. Yeah, where do I send the check? Mm -hmm. but that's not. But that's not yeah. what he was promising. Yeah, he was depending on me assuming or or it being obvious to me or something that that paying the money for the deliverables would lead to something else I want, which he never articulated and didn't even give me a sense of, of what kind of uptick in analytics or view time or whatever his right. past clients had seen. It was purely deliverables. It yeah. would have been way more persuasive if he gave me some, you know, your results may vary, but this is the kind of thing that happens. And it was like, oh, you know, I see that you're, he didn't, he mentioned, I don't think he mentioned anything about my subscriber count or my view time or anything, which would oh. be the only thing I care about because that's the sort of, that's the sort of prime indicator on how you're doing on YouTube. It's so, like siloed thinking, you know, mm, it's like, mm. because this is my expertise and I can apply it and this can be better versus, well, what is your client value? Yeah. And how does this deliver an outcome that they value, preferably value highly? Yeah, right. Like I, I would connect, you know, if I was, if I was having, uh, I don't know, if I had multiple video, if I was getting regularly getting videos with like 30, 40,000 views, I would connect that down. I would, I would make the leap. I would trust that that would lead to good things down the line. But if that's not, if that's not what I'm paying for, if that's not on offer, if that's not even discussed as a, a likelihood then you know i'm, I'm out like i don't yeah. want to litter youtube with a bunch of one minute videos good bad or otherwise if they're not going to do something good for the viewers and good for me so mm -hmm. if, if you can't even give me a prediction of what your expectations would be after the first month then i, I can't even make a i can't there's no it's like do you want it you want three flats of shingles it's like why you know it's just like a piece that doesn't connect downstream to anything obvious to me. So, well, 
it's it's a little bit like the evolution of an expert. I won't say an authority. I'll just stick with expert. The evolution of an expert where this guy is probably really great at what he does. And he's mechanically, he knows what to do. He knows what to choose. But what he hasn't done yet is to connect his expertise to the outcomes his ideal clients value most. He's probably doing a spray and pray with this, Mm -hmm. like finding people who already have a YouTube channel. I mean, he may be focusing it on some level, but he's he's maybe at the halfway point in his development as an expert because he hasn't yet figured out, we're making this assumption, he hasn't yet figured out how to connect his work to results that are bigger than him. Well, he listens to the show, so he's going to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, get back to me. How how many, yeah. you know, how many view, uh, views or whatever, like the analytics that someone like me would care about, what's the likelihood of reaching those for those prices? And, and yeah. then we can talk turkey. Yeah, because that's what, that's what scares clients. It's like, am I investing in this and what's going to happen? And mm-hmm. it's not even that they necessarily need a guarantee. But they, they're looking for an order of magnitude. Yeah. In the ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Cool. Well, I didn't realize he was listening, so. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Probably will hear it. Uh, cool. Well, I don't know. Do we, do we land the plane? Um, I, I feel like, if nothing else, the takeaway, and this is, this is, for me, too, I've been noticed. I've been thinking about this, like, while <laughs> carting plaster out to the driveway for 10 days, it's like, like analyzing my, I'm perfectly happy to do it, really enjoying it. I'm not optimizing the, the job for efficiency. I'm opti- optimizing it for joy and, and fun. So it's taking me longer than it would if I was like really, really, you know, put the hammer down, so to speak. Uh, so I've had a lot of time to think about like, what, what are the motivations here as a buyer, air quotes, buyer of this, hiring myself to do this? What are the motivations? What are the pros and cons? Why, why did that, you know, you know, knowing full well that outsourcing or automating or, you know, taking things off your plate and understanding opportunity costs, why would I do this? Why am I enjoying this? And uh, so I've been thinking about a lot. And I, and if nothing else, I think exposing the complexity of the thought process, like it's so much more nuanced than, than it probably looks from the outside. Like, oh, this guy's cheap. He's going to do his own bathroom. It's like, no, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. way more complicated than that. Um, and if you, and I think, dear listener, if you analyze some of your bigger purchase decisions, especially ones that are project oriented, not just products, I mean, people don't generally buy a lot of project type stuff, but when you analyze your own thought processes, realize that if you're presenting your clients with a, you know, a long-term high ticket engagement, then they're probably going through a lot of the same, you know, uh, mechanics in their mind and wondering all these different things. Uh, and at a certain point, like you just, you just can't force them to see, like, let's see the value because they're looking at it in a completely different way than you yeah. are. Yeah. It's, it's their viewpoint and their mindset yeah. and their values related to the project. Mm-hmm. And there are people who will DIY not because they want to necessarily, but because it feels like their safest option. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, our job is to make us look safer. The safest option. Yeah, it really is. Cool. All right. Well, that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And we hope you join us again next time for the Business of Authority. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>